All right, so what I'll be preaching about tonight is an entire sermon dedicated to Elijah, the prophet Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite. And um, we started off reading 1 Kings 17. This is actually the first place in the Bible that we meet Elijah, where we get to know him, where we're introduced to the character of Elijah. And um, it's kind of interesting the way, the way it comes up because literally chapter 17, that first verse, it says, and Elijah the Tishbite. It's like we, he, he just kind of appears in the story. He's just, just as if he was always there the whole time. So it's an interesting introduction. But um, what I want to point out, where, you know, where he just kind of jumps on the scene, he comes on right after we hear, of, um, see the first thing about Ahab. King Ahab was a wicked king of Israel. And if we just jump back, if you're in chapter 17, look at the end of chapter 16. We're going to see our, our introduction to Ahab, in verse, starting in verse number 30. The Bible reads, And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So um, we see here Ahab, he's a wicked, he said he was more wicked than all the kings before him. And king, Israel, had, to this point, had some wicked kings. And if you remember from your Bible reading, you know, kings are often referred back to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, because he was like the standard of a really wicked king. And he was that, that first king after um, Judah and Israel split. And he's the one that built the idols and caused basically the whole nation to sin and to go and worship false gods instead of going down into Jerusalem and worshiping the Lord where they should have been doing. He set up the false idols and really did a lot of damage to, um, to people who wanted to serve the Lord and to the country in general because of that. And we see Ahab here. He did worse than all of them. He, did worse, he was even worse than Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And to top that off, he married a very wicked woman, in Jezebel, his wife. And um, we continue on here. It says in verse 32, And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So Ahab makes God really, really angry. And what we're going to notice with Elijah, it's kind of... Elijah and Ahab are the two central characters as we go through these chapters. And really, when you hear them, like when you're reading the most about Elijah, it's always kind of in conjunction with Ahab. Elijah is the prophet that God really used to rebuke Ahab, to always be there in his face, telling him that he's wrong, and and you know, said trying to set him right. And um, so the two kind of go hand. We're going to be seeing a lot between a lot of interaction between these two as we cover the life of, of Elijah. Um, and it's kind of you know Ahab was an extremely wicked king, and Elijah was a really a really righteous man, a really godly man. He's he's one of the few that's that's referred back to as being like one of the great prophets. You know, really a really um, a really strong man of God. He was the one that was prophesied before Jesus Christ was going to come again, that um, Elijah must come again before the coming of the Lord. And Jesus Christ, and, and if you, you know, just, just so you, you're aware of this as we go forward, we're not really going to get into much New Testament. It's kind of later in the sermon. But when you see Elias in the New Testament, that's just the name for Elijah. And Elijah is not to be confused with Elisha. Elijah with a J we're studying tonight. Elisha is the, is the prophet that comes after Elijah. He's, he ends up, you know, he starts off, Elisha is the one kind of ministering to Elijah. Elijah calls him to come with him and to, you know, kind of help him out and be like his right-hand man, so to speak, right? And, and Elisha learns a lot from Elijah, and then he carries on his mantle later on and is blessed with a double portion from the Lord. And that's a whole other sermon about Elisha, who did many other great miracles and great things. He asked for a double portion of the spirit that was upon Elijah. And in the New Testament, so when you see, you'll see Elias and Elysius. And it can be a little confusing because they're real similar. 
And those are just the Greek names for these Hebrew names, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is Elias. Elisha is Elysius. It's an extra S in the name for Elisha. Um, just to try to help you keep that clear when you're reading about who are, who are we talking about in the New Testament when it references these people back. Um, and then Jesus said that, you know, this is Elias talking about John the Baptist, which was to come the, to prepare the way of the Lord. That was John the Baptist's role was he came in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. So, we, and I kind of covered this a little bit when I did a sermon on John the Baptist, if you remember. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm preaching this, and we'll get into this a little bit more in detail in a, in a little bit, is that we need a good understanding of what a man of God, a preacher, ought to be like. Because this world has, has taken and twisted, you know, what a, what a godly man is. What a, what a godly prophet or preacher is like and, and what they should be like. It's been, the people have tried to make the, the, you know, people who hold the office of a bishop or a deacon or just a preacher in general, even if you're not a, not a, you know, a pastor, into someone who's effeminate. And they've really sissified the, the, the you know, someone who's going to be a godly man. And that's because they've done the same thing to Jesus Christ. The world has put this, this image of Christ out there that he was like this hippie type of, of just, you know, long hair and soft-spoken and let's love everybody. This is, this is the image that they put out there. And this is the same image. And this is the image that Hollywood's going to put out there of supposed men of God. Right? That's the, 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 what they're going to portray you as, and which, which is why it's kind of funny sometimes when... Um, even just out soul winning today, people don't expect the reactions that they get out of us when we go out soul winning as men, when they, you know, when we are confronted with a threat or something like that. Now look, we're not brawlers, we're not going out looking to get in a fight, and we don't have pride where if someone, you know, yells something at us that we're going to be like, oh, oh man, you better not, you know, it's, it's not that type of an attitude. But at the same time, we don't let people push us around either. You know, we don't let someone say, you know, like, well, you guys, you don't go over there and you don't go next door either. And, you know, telling us not to go soul winning and not to do this and that because they're not going to tell me what to do. And it's funny how they, they think you're just going to buckle and cave and just run away and tuck your tail between your legs and run because they think you have no spine. Because they think you're a coward because that's what the, you know, the media will portray a man of God to be like. As opposed to a real man who's going to stand up and, and resist the devil and make him go run away and flee. And um, but so that's one of the reasons why I'm preaching about Elijah tonight, because we're going to see some characteristics about him that we ought to be expecting from preachers today. Now, obviously, he did a lot of miracles. He did a lot of other things that um, you can't just expect everybody to go around performing these same miracles. Um, when you look at the miracles that were performed, there is not very many performed over a span of thousands of years. So it's not an everyday occurrence. But the miracles aside, there's lots of other attributes in the preaching and the way that, that he presents himself that, we, that I want to kind of focus in on and look at um, in the way that, that Elijah was. Because mind you, when, when we look at these, his dealings with Ahab, Ahab's the king. And, and keep that in mind as we read and you see the boldness and, and the, the, the manner of speech that he uses when he's talking to the king. I get the impression that Elijah is not a respecter of persons because Elijah seems to talk to him just like he's anybody else. And it doesn't matter that he's the king. And he's not going to bow down or kowtow to, to someone just because, you know, that's especially someone who's extremely wicked just because they hold the title of being the king. And uh, we're going to see that here in his dealings with Ahab. But let's... Um, we already read the entire chapter for... Elijah, for, for chapter 17, I'll just do a brief summary of what we see here. Because Elijah was a great man. And we see, we see some pretty cool things here when um, he starts off in verse number one, confronting Ahab. And look at what he says in verse one. He says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew 
nor rain these years, but according to my word. He's saying it's not going to rain. There's not even going to be dew. I mean, think about that. Think about how dry that is. That, that is a drought when there's not even dew. I mean, we get dew here all the time and there's, it's not even close to raining, right? I mean, you just get dew on the ground normally. He's saying there's not even going to be any dew, no rain, extremely dry drought until I say so, essentially, is what he's saying, and according to my word. And um, then God comes to him and says, you know, okay, I want you to go over here because God's going to protect him during this drought. A, um, Elijah prays unto God that it wouldn't rain, and it doesn't rain. For three years, it doesn't rain. And God says, okay, you know, go hide yourself by this brook. This brook of water. This is a little place. You got some water here. And he prepared it. It's really cool. It's really interesting. He has the ravens. He has these birds come. They bring him flesh to eat. They bring him bread to eat. And he's drinking the water out of the brook. And they're just completely sustaining him. While he's just kind of hiding out here. While the whole rest of the land is, is you know, going through famine. Because it's not raining. And even when that brook dries up. Then God sends him away again, and he says, okay, you know, there's, there's, no, you know there's, there's nothing left for you here. Go unto this woman in, uh, in this city. And it says here, it says, the word of the Lord came unto him in verse number 8. Verse number 9, arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belong to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So God's already spoken. We can infer that he says, I've commanded a widow woman to take care of thee there. So this woman should know that Elijah's coming, right? And she needs to take care of him. And so he rises, he goes, and he sees the woman out gathering some sticks, right? And when he sees her, he's like, he calls unto her and says, hey, you know, go fetch me some water. I'm thirsty, give me, I just, I just got into town. Go, please go get me some water. And then, he, and then he stops her as she goes to get him some water and says, hey, while you're at it, why don't you go bring me some bread too? And then she answers him and she's like, you know, well, what I'm out here doing is getting some sticks so that I can prepare the last of my food. She's like, I've got a little bit of oil and just a little bit of, of meal, I think is what it was, in, a, in a, a little oil in a cruise. And she says, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel. So just a little bit of, of, of meal to, to make food with. And he's like, he's like, Okay, he's like, yeah, you know, you, could, you can keep getting your sticks, but um, just go and do what I said first. He's like, just, just, go, just go get me some food. And then he says, you know, fear not, because God's told me, basically, he's like, the oil is not going to fail, and you, you're going to continue to have meal. And that's exactly what happened. So God just miraculously provides Elijah, this widow woman, and her son with food for the entire time that he's there. And, I mean, there's so many interesting stories when we see this about Elijah where God's just completely looking out for him and completely protecting him. And keep that in mind also because God really cares about Elijah and he's looking out for him. And we can see him do a lot of things that some people might say, oh, he shouldn't do that or, you know, like maybe judging him. God's looking out for him and taking care of him. So I, it seems to me he's doing the right thing. Like telling Ahab that it's not going to rain on the earth. Well, if God didn't want to listen to that prayer, he wouldn't have. But he did. He listened to it and it didn't rain. And um, so let's continue on here with the story. So we see all this. And then, um, so then while he's there, her, her son gets sick. And he's ready to, he's basically, die, he dies. He gets, he gets really sick. And then she's like, all upset about it, and says, um, O thou man of God, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? So, you know, she's all upset about this, and, you know, why, are my sins coming back to haunt me now? You know, after you've come here and, and you've kept us alive, you know, God's blessed us, we have this food, and now all of a sudden my son's going to die. So Elijah goes to God, and God hearkens to him, he listens to him. And the, the son is brought back to life. Again, another amazing miracle. It's one amazing miracle after another, just in this one chapter of God using the ravens to, to keep Elijah alive. And then the, the food also being um, 
not failing and then this 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 child being brought back to life and you know one of the things we can learn from this is if we uh if we're trusting in god it doesn't matter how little we have it's like that song little is much when god is in it you know even when you have just a little bit if you're completely going to rely on god he could stretch that out and make that work for you to provide your needs for you even if it's just a little bit it's just reminiscent of the of the you know the um the five fishes or the, uh, the five loaves of bread and two fishes among the 5,000. They, they said, what, it, what is this among so many? Well, when you're willing to just have faith in God and just give Him what you got and just say, here, God, this is, this is all I have. Make this work for me. He'll do it. And he, made, he made the five loaves and, and two fishes work for, to feed 5,000. And He made the little bit of, of uh, oil and the little bit of meal that this widow had to, to feed them for days and days and days and days on end, you know, just to, to provide for them. But um, I forgot to, to bring this up. Let's, let's look at, um, turn to chapter 18. Because it's also important to keep in mind here that Elijah lived during a time in Israel when there was persecution against the prophets of the Lord. Um, we tend to think of Israel as always being a nation where, well, yeah, they served God, they served the Lord, and um, there would be no problem for the prophets to be able to preach about the Lord because it's the nation of Israel, right? I mean, that's just kind of the, the common thought you might have when you think back, but actually it's not the case. There have been plenty of times, especially in the nation of Israel as opposed to Judah, the, the, the kingdom of Israel had a lot of wicked kings, and they oftentimes had gone and served other gods, before and then getting, you know, judged by God and getting taken out of the land and then brought back when they would return back to God. But this at this particular point, it's not very good for for people who serve the Lord, for prophets of the Lord. Look at verse three of first Kings 18. It says, and Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So Ahab's wife, Jezebel, she was one, you know, she was a, a daughter of a king in, in the king of Zidon. And um, she worshipped Baal. She was a Satan worshiper because that's what Baal is. He's a devil. Okay. So she's basically a devil worshiper. Now, they probably wouldn't come all out looking like a devil worshiper today, just like people who worship the devil today don't, aren't going to come out like the Anton LaVey's saying that, oh, I worship Satan and stuff. It's not as obvious because Satan's transformed into a minister of light, so they try to make themselves look real good. Um, but nonetheless, Baal is a false god, and that's who she worshiped, and she had the, the prophets of the Lord killed. That's what it says when she had them cut off. She had them killed. So this guy, Obadiah, he's, you know, he worshiped the Lord. So he decided to hide some of the prophets so that they wouldn't get killed too. And um, this, is, this is the time that Elijah's living in. It's under the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, where Jezebel really has it out for the prophets of the Lord. So keep that in mind too when we see Elijah, or, yeah, Elijah going up to Ahab and just saying, Hey, look, it, it's not going to rain and don't expect it to rain until I say so. And just going to his face and telling him that when he's a prophet of the Lord, um, after the, even in spite of this type of persecution. The boldness of Elijah is tremendous. And again, Ahab the king is blaming Elijah for the drought and the famine since he told Ahab that it wouldn't rain until he says. Um, jump down to verse 17 of 1 Kings 18. Because here we're going to see Elijah explain that Ahab's the actual problem. Because Ahab's sitting there thinking like, you brought this on us. Why did you do this? You know, why, why are you making it not rain? As if, you know, Elijah is the problem. And like, that's the source of the problem is Elijah. So Ahab has it out for Elijah after, after this event, especially when it doesn't rain. Uh, look at verse 17. The Bible reads, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Saying, you're, you're the guy that's troubling Israel. You're the, one, you're, the, you're the problem in this land. Verse 18, And he answered, 
I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. <clears throat> so he, exp and then verse, uh, verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab goes out and does that. And, you know, Ahab finds, or Elijah, he doesn't even find him. Elijah goes back to Ahab and confronts him. And he's like, Ahab wants, he basically wants to kill Elijah for, for bringing all this trouble on Israel. And he's like, look, you're the one that's serving the false gods. You're the one that's bringing all of this on the nation. It's not me. If Ahab wasn't doing all that and wasn't so wicked, Elijah would have never said anything about it not reigning for three years because they would have been doing righteously. Elijah just basically prayed for that judgment to come upon Israel so that they could get right with God, so that they could turn back to the Lord. That was the whole point of him doing it when the, the true cause of the problem was in Ahab, it wasn't in Elijah. So he tells them, he says, okay, go, go and fetch and get these 450 prophets of Baal. Go, go get them. Go round them up. And Ahab listens to him. He goes out and does it. And this is one of my absolute favorite stories in the Bible. And I think Elijah is probably one of my favorite characters. I'm really enjoying um, preaching about him tonight. Look at verse 21 of chapter 18. The Bible says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. So he's, he's bringing things to a head. He's making it real uncomfortable. He's going out and saying, okay, look, we've got the prophets of Baal over here, and then we got me. I'm preaching the Lord. They're all preaching the Baal. There's, there's the popular crowd. There's the majority, right? They're all worshiping Satan. I'm going to worship the Lord. And he's talking to these people like, why don't you make up your minds? Who are you going to follow? If you're going to serve Baal, then go ahead and serve him. But if you're going to serve God, then serve him. And they just didn't answer. He's like, how long halt you between two opinions? Look, they're saying one thing. I'm saying another. You need to decide what you believe. And he, and he really just brings it up to a head, right? Um, it says in verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So there's a lot of them. There's one of me. But you need to decide what you believe. Now, Elijah was a man that wasn't worried about how popular he was, obviously. If he's one versus 450 guys, he wasn't concerned even about his own safety. We know that, that Jezebel was, was very um, much against the prophets of the Lord, enough to go out and have them killed. But that didn't bother him at all. He seemed to be a little rough around the edges because he's not mincing his words. He's just bringing it up and just saying it the way that it is. And he addressed the problem head on without beating around the bush. Right? That's another thing I like about Elijah. He's not, he's not kind of dancing around the issue and saying, well... You know, I know they've got some pretty good points and they've got, you know, he's like, no, look, they're saying one thing. I'm saying something different. Two different gods. Decide what you believe. And he did a very good job of forcing people to make that decision. Now, this is something I think we should all learn from because religion itself is a topic that makes people uncomfortable. It's one of those, those taboos in our society. Oh, you can't talk about politics and you can't talk about religion. Yeah, we, we can't, do, you can't do that. That is socially unacceptable. It's a philosophy of Satan because those are the things that actually matter. Does it, does it divide? Sure. Yeah, absolutely it can, but it matters. This matters more than the, the degrees of, of the temperature out, outside today. Because, I mean, or, or the sports game that was on last week or some movie that some some filthy movie you saw two weeks ago. You know, those things are meaningless. They're vanity. And to spend all of your time just talking about vain things is a waste of your life. We need to be able to not be afraid to talk about religion. And is it going to make some people uncomfortable? You bet it is. But that's okay. Because it needs to happen. People need, for one, people need to get saved. 
But there's plenty of religions out there and people are always worried. They're worried about offending people and say, oh, well, if the, if I don't want to offend you because you believe different than, than I do. And, and, and it amuses me. I, kind of, I crack a smile every time someone will actually bring up religion with me because they beat around the bush a lot and they kind of dance around, well, I don't know, you know, like, I don't want to offend you. I don't know if this is again, you know, like, just come out and say it. But if you believe something, just say it. Right? You shouldn't be ashamed of what you believe. I'm not ashamed about what I believe. I'll tell you exactly what I believe. I don't feel the need to have to dance around the issue. But there's also so many people out there that just, they just don't want to make up their minds about what they believe. And they'll say things like, well, all religion's pretty good. Well, you know, these, these, they all have their good aspects to them. You know, as long as, long as you're doing right, kind of helping people out, and you're following a philosophy that, that's doing pretty good things, then, it, then it's all good, right? And those are people who don't really want to think about it very deep. They say, yeah, it's all okay. And honestly, that's how a lot of people kind of have their attitude today. They, 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 don't, they halt between two opinions, or 20 opinions or whatever. They don't, they don't really care. They're not, they're not making a stand and just saying, no, this is the truth and this is right. They're like, yeah, they all got some good. They all got some bad. You know, it's kind of a, a mix of both. But we need to be more like Elijah and talk about the Lord and get people to make a decision. Get people to make the decision for serving God, for serving the Lord. And that's exactly what we try to do when we go out soul winning. We're trying to get people to that point to where they make that decision to put their faith in Jesus Christ and not just, well, I don't know. I'm still kind of up in the air about it. I've thought about it a little bit. I, I don't really know. I don't know where I'm going to go when I die, but yeah. And they just, they just don't make a decision. And that's the case with so many people. But we, we, and that's what I'm saying. We, we need to take some tips from Elijah of how he doesn't just beat around the bush. He just brings it up and, and makes a point out of it to get people to think about that. Look at uh, verse number 27. Because here we're seeing in this story where he basically makes this deal. This is just to summarize. And I know we've gone over this story in the past, but I love this story. And he makes this deal. He says, okay, look. Because after he says, you know, how long haul you be between two appeals, between two opinions? And he says, okay, the prophets of Baal, you get your sacrifice ready. You know, get everything all ready. The only thing you can't do, you can't, you can't put any fire there. So you get your wood, you get the animal, you know, chop it up however you want to do, however you, you know, you want to perform your sacrifice. And he says, the only thing you can't do is, is use any fire because he says the God that answers by fire, that's the God. He says, that's going to prove who is the true God. You do your thing and I'll do mine. He, and he lets them go first. He's saying, go ahead, have at it. Right? So they start off in the morning, they're crying out to to, to Baal, oh Baal, you know, come and, and doing all their chants and, and all of their, their, their Satan worship and trying to get them to, to um, you know, uh, to take the, the offering. So after a little while, Elijah sees this and he says in verse 27, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. So now he starts to mock them. And said, cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he's in a journey. Or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. He's like, maybe your god's sleeping. <laughs> cry out a little bit louder and he'll hear you. And he's just totally mocking him because he knows that it's a false god. It's a dumb idol that they worship. It's not real. It's just like a, a stump. It's like, it's like me talking to the tree in the backyard saying, okay, you know, I put all the wood in my fire pit, just, okay, make it burn up now. And I, and I put an offering or something out there and I'm just talking to the tree. It's stupid. <laughs> the tree's not going to do anything. And that's what they're doing with their false god. And that's like every false god. That's how ridiculous it is. But not with the Lord. Because he is God. Because there is one true God and it is the Lord. And that's who Elijah worships. So he's out there then mocking him. And they're out there making fools of themselves. And I, I just, I, just love, I love that about Elijah. You, you see his, his attitude where he's like, he's, he's okay with mocking him. He's okay with making what they believe look really dumb because it is. And you know what? Oftentimes, you know, people, oh, I don't like how critical you are of the Catholic Church or how critical you are of these other false, you know, whatever it is. 
Doesn't matter what it is. It could, I mean, any religion, name it. The, the, the Hindus or Islam or whoever. You got to point out the truth about these things and, and sometimes you got to make them look so stupid so that people can get through their heads like, yeah, that really is dumb. Why would I even think about believing in that? Why is it, why is it even a choice like, let's see, I'm considering what I should believe and, and should I believe in, in Christ or should I believe in Muhammad or what? And look, I was at this point at one point in my life before I got saved and I started learning about different religions and stuff, but I was halting between two opinions. I didn't know what to believe. And you, sometimes you need a man of God just to be like, this is stupid. <laughs> and, and show, you know, like, like, that's not a real God. The Allah of, of Islam is a false God. That's not a real God. That's not someone you need to be worshiping. So he's out there mocking. And then... Um, uh, continuing on here, it says um, in verse 28, And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. So they're getting so serious about this now after he's mocking them. They're like, they actually just start cutting themselves thinking that, you know, and, and that this is how wicked their, their false gods are. As if that would be something that their false, their god would be like, Oh, now I see how serious you are because you're actually hurting yourself and cutting yourself and mutilating yourself. Now I see that you're worthy of me to answer you, right? And I mean, this would be the way that they're thinking of doing these different things when it's just twisted and bizarre. I mean, the Lord would never have you to be, you know, cutting yourselves and doing things like that. And um, the only thing that would, you could even say that would come close to that is when God told Abraham to, to offer up his son Isaac. But that's not the same because Abraham was already promised of the Lord that he was going to, you know, that, that his seed was going to um, bring forth, you know, thousands and, and his seed was called Isaac and everything. And we'll get into that in Genesis. But, um, but he knew and fully expected God to, you know, for him to reenact the... Um, Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, that, that God was able to resurrect his son from the dead. And God prevented him from doing so. But these people, they're crying aloud, they're cutting themselves, so the blood gushed out. It says, and it came to pass when midday was passed. So they did this from morning to noon, and then midday, as they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So they're doing this all day long. And nothing is happening. It says, there, there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. He's like, all right, guys, gather around. Because, and he's, notice he's doing everything right, too. He, Elijah does everything the way that God had ordained for the sacrifices to be made. There was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. So he lets them go all morning, all afternoon, all day. And then it gets, starts getting time, like around this time, it would be time for the evening sacrifice, right? And um, so he calls everyone around. All the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So the, the altar that they used to perform the sacrifices on was broken down. It was in disrepair because nobody was using it because they're all worshiping these false gods. They're worshiping Baal. So he repairs it. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. So he repairs the, the, the altar. He puts the wood on there. He puts the animal, cuts up the animal, puts it on there the way it ought to be done. And then he's like, okay, get four barrels of water and dump it. Dump it over the wood. Dump it over the, the sacrifice. Dump it over everything. And he builds this trench all the way around the altar. This, this, this trench. And I, you know, I don't know exactly how deep... Um, the uh, whatever it says, but but he, he builds this regardless. He builds a trench around it, so he, they do it three times. They're just dumping all, they're just soaking it, dumping all this water over it, and then he fills that whole trench up with water all the way around it, proving like 
You guys couldn't get a spark. You couldn't get anything to happen on your sacrifice. He's like, see what, what you want to see what my God can do? I'm going to drench it completely because they're waiting for the, for the sacrifice to be burnt up. He's saying there's no, there's no tricks up his sleeve. He's not, you know, he doesn't have some, some contraption built underneath his altar where it's going to spark and light this fire. He's drenching it all. And then it says um, in verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So the fire of God comes down, sit up. The fire of God comes down and everything's consumed. I mean, he consumes the, you know, the, the sacrifice, the wood, the stones for the altar, and even all the water that was in the trench roundabout, just poof, the whole thing from God. So this is like, this is an amazing event. The people see that and they're like, okay, I'm going to follow Elijah and, and the Lord because obviously that's the power of God. And that's exactly what happened. So it says in um, verse 39, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Now look at this. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. The prophet of the Lord, Elijah, kills these other false prophets, these, these Satan worshipers, these deceivers. These are not just your... And again, it's so important to understand this concept of the false prophet and the reprobate that we see in the book of Jude, that we see in the book of uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. When we see these, these, these references to these people, they're called children of the devil. Just like when we're saved, we're born again, we're children of God. These are people that have completely rejected the Lord and have become children of Satan. And they dedicate their lives to, to deceiving people and doing the work of their false god, Satan, who they set up for themselves. And this is why you know, he goes and, and, and has them killed. He kills them. Elijah the prophet does that. And you know, when I read this, it reminds me of Samuel. Flip back, if you would, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Keep your finger here in 1 Kings. Turn backwards a little bit to 1 Samuel chapter 15. When Saul goes out against the Amalekites, they were supposed to destroy them all and wipe them out completely. And Saul disobeyed God, the, the commandment of the Lord. And he kept you know, the best of them alive and he kept the king alive. And Samuel gets, uh, he gets upset about this. And look at verse number 32. It's right at the end of the chapter. The Bible reads, Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. So he's like walking on eggshells up to, up to Samuel. Right? And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. So he's like pleading for his life. He's like, you know, the, the war is over. I lost. Um, you know, the, you're, not, you should, you're not bitter against me anymore, right? I mean... The bitterness of death is, is over. We're, we're, we're beyond that now, right? Because you know, here I'm not going to do anything. You've already killed me. You know, he's, 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 he's coming to him kind of just like, we're, we're, we're okay, right, Samuel? Verse 33, And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. So here we see another prophet of God, the priest, right? He was the priest at these times, Samuel. 
he was the, the last judge of Israel before Saul became king. And he hews Agag, he, he cuts him up into pieces. Now, how different is this of the view of a man of God than what you're presented with in the media? Or even from other churches and things like that of, of what a man of God should be like. These men are not wimps. They're not weaklings. They're not pushovers. They're not pansies. We see Elijah killing these prophets of Baal. And we see Samuel doing the same thing with Agag. He chops them up into pieces. And I believe both of them are able to do this because they have the proper love of God and the proper hatred of that type of a wickedness. And they know what needs to be done and they're not afraid to do it. Flip back, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 18. And you notice from that story with Samuel, he, he did it before the Lord. He, he hewed him up before the Lord in Gilgal is what it said. And it's not, God's not disapproving of what they did at all. And if you remember in the law of Moses, which, was, which should have still been in effect during the time of Elijah, people who were going to go around and, and preach, you know, get people to, to, to worship other gods that were not the Lord, was the, they had the death penalty on that. And that was something that should have been in effect under their law, which is why Elijah was, uh, was justified in what he did. But now we're in um, So after that happens, with the story with the, with the, the sacrifice being made, and then Elijah kills the, the prophets, and you know Ahab doesn't do anything either. He just, he just kind of hangs back. And it says in verse 41, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So now he's saying, you know what, the rain's going to come now. And because he had kind of cleared out a lot of the a lot of the wickedness just by by getting rid of those prophets of Baal and by getting the people energized now to serving the Lord and getting them to the point where they made that decision, you know, we're going to serve God. And um, verse 42 says, so Ahab went up to eat and to drink and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. So he, he, he sends his servant out and saying, OK, go look. And seven times he goes out and then a seventh time he sees there's this little cloud coming. It's like a form of a hand. So um, Elijah goes and calls unto Ahab and he says, OK, you know, prepare your chariot. Get out of here because the rain's coming and you're going to get stuck if you don't get out of here right now. And um, so that's what he does. Verse 45 says, And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So another just fascinating thing that, that God does with Elijah, he runs before the chariot. You think a chariot would get somewhere faster, right? Because he's got horses and wheels. And I mean, they're, they're, they're running off. Elijah ran and made it to Jezreel before Ahab does, is what it's saying here. That um, because the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, so he, you know, he buckled his belt, and uh, he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He ran before him. So he got there first. And um, we're going to see in chapter 19 now, Jezebel hears about all of this stuff, and she wants to have um, Elijah killed because he just killed 450 of the prophets of Baal, which that's the false god that she worshipped was Baal. And um, now we're going to see even a, 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 someone as strong of a man of God as Elijah gets weary. He gets tired of fighting the battle. You, you, you got to remember, he feels all alone. He said before, he's like, look, the prophets of Baal, 450, and here I am all by myself serving God. I'm alone, the, the only prophet of the Lord left, which is already a... a a hard struggle to deal with when you feel like I'm the only one that believes this way and that's you know what the world's going to try to make you think that when you get these these attacks and 
unfortunately, we have a lot of people who are silent on issues. And the, the, the minority of extremely wicked people are just really loud. They have, a loud. they have a big platform. They have a loud megaphone, if you will, where they're able to say whatever they want and nobody stands up to them. And they make you think that they're a lot bigger than they actually are. I mean, the sodomites will have you think that like one out of every two people is a homo. That's what they would want you to think. They want you to think that it's just so normal when really it's a really small percent of the population that's a homo or a reprobate. Very small percent. But they want you to think, oh yeah, I mean, that's why, that's why like every TV show probably on air now, and I don't even know what's out there, but I hear about it from time to time. They're all having homo characters and getting married and doing this and pushing their, their social agenda. And it's like, that's not even reality. That's not real life. You don't have that many people that are just homos as, as part of your job and part of your family and part of, you know, and all this other stuff. It's not, it's not even reality, but they want you to make, to, to make you think that it is. And um, part of it is a scare tactic. And, and they, they, they want to be really loud and vocal to get you to back down and think that, oh, well, I'm, I'm all alone on this. And to, to take the wind out of your sails and make you think that, that you're weak and you need to back down and things like that. This is one of the attacks of the enemy. This is what they're going to try to do and get into your head. And... Um, a lot of times when you, when you are like, you feel like you're the only one standing up for anything because no one's out there supporting you, you can feel like, man, you know, like, is anybody going to just listen to me? I mean, like Elijah's probably thinking, what more do I have to do? You know, I did all of this work. I showed the people that God is the Lord. What else, what else can I do? And now, now I'm still going to be put to death. You know, it's like, He's kind of kind of thrown up his head. Well, we'll, we'll read what he says, what it says here in um, chapter 19. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he qu requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So now he, he, gets, he gets pretty depressed. He gets down. He's saying, You know what, God? Like, just end my life now. You know, it sounds like he's just kind of getting sick of the fight. And, you know, no matter what he does, they're still trying to get him. And he feels a little bit defeated. But, um, you know, the death threats are finally getting. The death threats, the fighting against all this stuff, the standing up to the king and, and voicing his concern and, you know, getting rid of the, the, the prophets of Baal. He's still, it's finally getting, up, getting to him and catching up to him. And, you know, this can happen to, to preachers and pastors too, which is one of the reasons why we pray for, for all the good churches that we know of, that they'll be strengthened in the Lord. Because I, there's multiple, I've been attacked, Pastor Romero's been attacked, Pastor Anderson's been attacked, I'm sure Pastor Mendes has probably been attacked. You know, all these people that are, that are standing up and preaching the truth especially about the sodomites, you know, you get attacked with a lot of hatred and, and, and death threats and disgusting, perverted things that these wicked reprobates want to do to you and, and, and come at you with. And they'll try to make you think that you're crazy. They write all this stuff, you know, you're nuts and, all, and, and just try to get into your head to make you think that you're all alone on this. And then the people who do agree, Mostly guys aren't even saying anything because they get afraid of getting attacked and they don't want to say anything publicly. Every once in a while, someone will write you like a private little message saying, hey, we support you. But nobody coming. And, and, you know, obviously we know we have a lot of support. But if the people who just, who just agreed and would, would, would voice their, you know, their assent and voice their dissent with all that wickedness, if everyone would just do it, like the, the, the opposition would be overwhelmed. And it would be obvious that they just need to shut up and go back in the closet. But too many people are afraid 
to make that stand. Too many people are just, they don't want to feel uncomfortable. They don't want to have anyone looking bad. They don't want to look bad because they actually care about what these other people think, about what the perverts think, or, or about what their coworkers or someone else who might be in support of the homos think. I don't care what any of them think. I care about what's right. I care about my children. I care about the society that they're going to grow up in. I don't care about what a family member is going to think of me. I don't care what a coworker is going to think of me. I don't care about any of it. I'm going to scream and kick and yell against the wickedness of the society so that they can grow up in a normal place without just a bunch of perverts running around freely and spreading their wickedness. I want them to live in relative safety. So Elijah here is getting, you know, he's, he's in despair. He's saying, God, just, just kill me already. I'm, I'm getting tired. Look at verse number five. We'll see what God does for him. The Bible says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. God said, I'm not done for you yet, with you yet. You, you've, got, you've got a journey ahead of you. You need to be strengthened. And uh, verse 8 says, And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. So we see here, God's providing exactly what he needs. Now, is he still, is he getting just this overabundance of, of blessing because he did what's right? No, but he's giving him what he needs. I mean, think about, he, he eats a couple meals and then he goes 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long time. I've never gone 40 days and 40 nights then with, on, on the strength of, of two meals. Um, but he gave him what he needed. That's the strength that he needed to get to the next point that God wanted him to be at. And we have to understand this, that serving the Lord and serving God, you will not be comfortable doing it. And if you're just comfortable serving God, you're not doing it right. You're not. And you, you, can't, you cannot fully be serving the Lord and just have everything comfortable just not going to happen. There's going to be people that are going to hate you and if you're doing it right, that's just going to be the way it is. Now, it's not, is it that you want people to hate you or you're trying to get people to hate you? No, but it will happen if you're serving the Lord. They called the master of the house Beelzebub how much more they have his household. How much more? You look at what they called Jesus Christ, how much more are they going to call you? If you're following him, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, it's going to come. So God strengthens them. He edifies them. He builds them up. He doesn't make them comfortable, but He gives them what He needs and provides for them just like He did in the drought. Now, again, He wasn't in a mansion. He wasn't living it up as the birds were bringing some food for Him to eat as He's drinking out of the brook. But He was sustained. He had what he needed. And again, it's, we got to wrap our mind around this. We live in, a, in an age or in a day and in a country, in an area where we have wealth. We have abundance. We have way more than we actually need. Yet, oftentimes, we think we don't have what we need. And when we put it in the right perspective, we can realize how silly we can be sometimes thinking, I need this. We're, uh, Silly example, we we're talking about the Vitamix or something. It'd be something like saying like, oh, I need one. We need to have that. I don't know what I'm going to do without one. And that's not what anyone was saying, but it's kind of a silly thing. But that's the type of attitude we can have in today's, in today's society, in today's day, because we have so many other things. You just think, oh, man, we, just, we need to have this. No, you don't. You need to eat. You need to drink. You need to have clothing. That's what you need. And you probably have plenty of it. Everything else is just, I mean, it's great. Praise the Lord for, for, for the extra stuff that you have. But it, please don't, 
guard your mind from, from getting into a covetous attitude of thinking that we need more than we have. Because God provides you with your needs. And it's a lapse of faith when you start to think you don't have the things that you need. Because God will provide you with what you need. He's promised to do that. Although His idea of what you need oftentimes is different than your idea of what you need. And we need to try to make sure that, that we're in tune with what God expects and what, what God's standards are for our necessities. Elijah went 40 days and 40 nights on two meals. And God deemed that to be acceptable for, to meet his needs. So we ought to keep that in mind, even if we go hungry for a day, which none of us are even doing. We have it very good, my friends. But um, so here we see Elijah, you know, he's feeling all alone in this fight. He just wants to die. Um, so then God, he brings them to this place. He travels for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he meets with them and speaks to them. And we read this story earlier um, in another, another um, uh, sermon about the still small voice. Do you remember he goes and he's in this cave and then there's this earthquake and the fire and all this stuff happens when God kind of comes on the scene. And then, you know, Elijah gets scared. He wraps his face in his shirt and, and he goes out to meet him. And it says um, in verse 13 of chapter 19, And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering into the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, throw down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. So again, we see another prophet of God. He's he's God is is now informing Elijah. Because Elijah is so down, he needs to be edified, he needs to be built up. So God's God's letting him know. Hey, this is my plan. Okay? And he didn't know God's plan before. He's just doing what he's supposed to be doing. But now he's finally gotten kind of down. So God's saying, okay, look, this is the plan. And this is why you don't need to be wishing to die right now. Because I'm taking care of things. And this is what he's, he's, he's planning on, you know, these kings getting killed and getting replaced. He's saying, I already have it. He's like, you're going to go and you're going to appoint, anoint Jehu to be king in Ahab's place. And Jehu does a lot of cleaning up. And, um, you know, he, he's replacing the king of Syria as well. And then he says, Elisha is going to come and replace you. He's going to be a prophet in your stead. And so he's saying, okay, the people that, that Hazael don't, who he doesn't get, who get away from him, who he is not able to kill, well, Jehu's going to clean that up. And then the people who get away from Jehu, he says, Elisha is going to clean that up. He's going to kill them. So we see another, you know, God's plan for one of the men of God, one of the prophets of Elisha, is, is still going to be killing these wicked people that need to be destroyed. Um, verse number 18, but look at this. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. And so God's telling him, look, you're not alone. In fact, not only are you not alone, there's 7,000 people that do not worship Baal, that are, that are right with me, right? My question is, where were these people? Why does Elijah feel so alone? Of these 7,000 people, why wasn't anyone coming to his aid? Why wasn't anybody standing up with him? and allowing this great man of God to get to this point to where he feels like everybody's forsaken him and there's not even anyone left in the whole world that worships the Lord.
If you haven't bowed the knee to Baal today, you need to be showing your support for the Elijahs of today's world. For the people that are putting themselves out there on the forefronts, on the front lines of this battle against wickedness. And publicly showing your support because they're the ones that are receiving the death threats and the ire of this world. And believe me, you may not always be hearing about it, but it's happening. It happens quite a bit. And, um, and they need that type of support to know that they're not alone. And here we see, you know, clearly there's plenty of people. And I believe, I firmly believe there's plenty of, there's thousands of people today that agree and believe the same way. But where are their voices? What are they doing? And now, especially, we live in a time where you can publicly voice what you believe on a platform that, that other people can actually see and hear. Where's all the support? <clears throat> now, you see it in the, in the little things of when the, when the sodomites attack a business and all of a sudden they raise all this money. But where are their voices? You say, oh, they're, they're using their dollars for voice. That's a, that's a cop-out. It's like the people who don't want to go out soul winning, but they'll put a bunch of money in for missions and say, well, you can go and do that. And they'll pay a bunch of money to these people who, oh, you're going to make a stand against the sodomites. Okay, well, I'll just give you some money and I'll feel like I'm participating and having a part in that. No, what's way more important than the money is you standing up and saying something. You, stand, you going out and giving the gospel is way more important than providing the money for the missionary. If you would go out and preach the gospel. Now, do both. Amen. Great, support the missionary and go out and go soul winning. But what's more important is that you are actually just doing the work and getting your hands dirty. And it's the same thing with, with giving the support for, against wickedness. Now, if you've noticed, most of these stories about, between, you know, the, 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 um, about Elijah, between Elijah and Ahab, they're negative. They're not, none of them are like this fun type of message or, or a positive message. They're all negative. And this one's no different. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 21. We're going to see one more story here. with the negative preaching. 1 Kings 21, look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. If you remember, Ahab coveted this field that belonged to Naboth, and he wanted it, and he said, Look, I'll buy it from you. Let me, you know, let's make a deal. I'll give you this under vineyard. And Naboth's like, No. It belongs to me. It belongs to my household. This is right. You know, even according to the Lord, you know, I, I can't just give away my inheritance. Like, this belongs to my family. So he says, no, you can't have it. Well, Naboth, or, um, Ahab pouts about it, and his wife goes and has Naboth killed so that he can just go and take it. Well, let's just get this pesky Naboth out of the way, and then I can just take his vineyard. Just claim it. So that's what happens. And he goes to take possession of it. It says in verse 17, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel." and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. He that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat, and him that dieth in the field to the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel's wife stirred up, 
and he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And I just want to point out Ahab there, he's calling, when he's talking to Elijah, he's calling him his enemy. Right? He said, oh, you, you, know, you found me out, my enemy? And, uh, and he is because Ahab is extremely wicked. He's a worker of wickedness and Elijah's there to rebuke him and to call out that wickedness. No matter what it means, he's going to shine a light on it um, because it needs to be exposed. But now I want you to, to, I want to point out here, this is the reason why the negative preaching needs to happen. I mean, he goes to him with a very negative message saying, you know, the dogs are going to lick your blood where, where the dogs lick Naboth's blood. It's coming back around on you and it's going to come back in a fury. No one likes to hear that message, but look what it does to Ahab. Look at verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. He humbled himself. Finally, at the preaching of the Lord and at the judgment of the Lord, he finally humbles himself. Verse 28, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. This is the purpose of the hard preaching. This is the purpose of the negative message. So that people can actually, finally, one day, hopefully, humble themselves. They may have to hear it over and over again. I mean, Ahab's a pretty hard case. But he finally did submit himself and humble himself and, and recognize his wretched wickedness that he had done. And we need that exposed to us so that we could keep ourselves humble and that we can continually try to get right with God. And other people need to hear the same message. Say, oh, you got to just be all loving all the time and, you know, you, that's the only way you're going to get people to listen to you. No, it's not. There's things that people want to hear, and then there's things that people need to hear. And unfortunately, oftentimes, the things that you need to hear is not pleasant. But it's needful. And we see it works. It does work. Now, it didn't work for a long time. But it finally did work in this case. Second Kings chapter one, last place we're going to look at tonight. We're going to, we're going to wrap it up. Elijah was not what the world would have you to believe as a stereotypical preacher. He's not the little house on the prairie preacher. He, uh, when he was described, Second Kings chapter one verse eight, it says that, you know they're they're asking about about him, like who he was, and it says and they answered him, he was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So when he heard that description of him, he's like, well, he's, he's kind of hairy, and he's got a leather belt, you know, this, this leather belt around his waist, and uh, yeah, that's Elijah. And he was a man. He was a, he was a godly man. He was not this well-kept little, you know, perfectly groomed, soft-spoken order. He did what God wanted him to do. He preached the truth. He preached the truth when it wasn't popular. He preached the truth regardless of his own safety, regardless of the popularity. And he did it honestly, and he did it completely, whether he was hated or anything. He did what was right. He wasn't concerned about his looks. He wasn't concerned about those things. Don't let the world dictate how a man of God should act or look like. Let's um, this this last we'll, we'll just read through this last story because it's it's basically kind of the, the final thing, um, the final the main stories of, of in the life of Elijah. We went through quite a bit tonight, and I just I just really wanted to get through all these different cool miracles and ways that God has used Elijah. And they all can be expounded on a lot more, but I wanted to give an overview of the man and to get a good understanding of him as a prophet, as a preacher, and um, just, just a little bit more knowledge about who Elijah was. And because keep this in mind too, 
John the Baptist was likened unto Elijah. Jesus Christ was likened unto Elijah by the people. When they said, who, you know, Jesus said, who, who do men say that I am? One of the people that they named was Elijah. And Jeremiah. You know, and John the Baptist. So, like, these are all character, you know, like these characteristics when we look at these men, they're all real pretty similar. I mean, they're saying that, well, he's kind of like this, he's kind of like that. Kind of, he kind of reminds me of this, of this preacher. We were reading almost everything about Elijah. And he's one of the ones that he was that, that Jesus Christ and John the Baptist were compared to. Jesus Christ and John the Baptist are good examples. And we just I just wanted to make sure we have a, we have a good picture of, of what a man of God, a, a, a righteous man of God, should look like. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 1. This is finally when Ahab's gone, and the king, now the new king, sending to uh, to go and, and get Elijah. It says, well, it says in verse number one, then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria. And was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Baal Zeba, the god of Ekron, where I shall whether I shall recover of this disease. So Ahaziah go, you know, he gets injured, he's, he's sending his servants out, he's like, Okay, go inquire of that god. He's he's in Israel, he's the king of Israel. He's saying, Go inquire of the of the god of Ekron. Right? So the angel of the Lord comes to Elijah and he says, you know. Go and meet these messengers that the king's sending out and just tell them what's going to happen. Right? Before they even get to this other, this other place. And it says, it's, it's the king of Samaria, excuse me. Um, he says in verse 3, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from, thy, from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die, and Elijah departed. So he's saying, You don't even need to go down. He's like, Isn't it because there's not a God here in Israel that you're just going to, to ask and inquire of some other God? He's saying, You're going to die. You're not going to be recovered. So the messengers get back to him real quick, and he's saying, like, Wait a minute, why, why are you back already? You know, there's no way you could have made it there by, by now. Verse 6 says, And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And this is when he asks him, he's like, Well, you know, what, what type of guy was this that told you? And that's when they tell him, you know, he's a hairy man, he had a leather um, uh, belt about his loins, and... Then the, the king finds out, he's like, oh yeah, that's Elijah the Tishbite. Verse number 9 says, then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. So now the king's saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring him over here. So he sends out, like, this unit of his army out, the, a, a captain over 50 men. He sends 50 guys to go and get Elijah. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. So you see the attitude of the very first captain that goes unto him. He's saying, you know, Hey, man of God, the king said to come down. Right? And he's there with his 50 men. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And again, also, he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. So he sent another 50 soldiers out. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, come down quickly. He's saying, look, hey, the king said to come down quickly. Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. The fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. And he sent again a captain of the third 50 with his 50. Now, mind you, 100 guys have, been, have died now. 
just going to get Elijah to, to, to come to the king. And, came, and it says, And the third captain of the fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Now, you notice a little bit of difference in attitude when he comes up to him and says, saying, like, Hey, the king called you. Get down here. Yo, go to the castle. He gets down and he's like, uh, Hi, excuse me, Elijah. <laughs> um, you think you could just show mercy on us and, you know, not kill us? And then it says in verse 14, Behold, um, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And then, um, and then he goes and basically tells the king the same exact thing, that, look, you're going to die because you're not trusting in God. And that's exactly what happens. Now, um, I mentioned this earlier, and I, and I know we're pretty much, I'm out of time, but I'll read this for you in James chapter 5. Elijah was a great man of God. And there's other references to him in the New Testament. But we see in James chapter 5, this is what I was talking about during the announcement, the, the power of prayer and the importance of prayer. We started off, when we first started reading about Elijah, he prayed for it not to rain. And God listened to his prayer. He prayed and said, you know, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from him. God, listen, all of these things that God did. He, he prayed unto God for the life of the child that died. And God recovered him. He, he brought his soul back into him. And, and the child died. All of these things are a result of Elijah asking God. Praying unto God. James 5, verse 16 says... <laughs> Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, so again, that's Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. So first he prays for it not to rain, and it doesn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. God listens to him and completely stops the rain, and then he listens to him again, and the rain comes. And the, the Bible is pointing out here in verse 17 that it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we see. Look, he's just a man like you. And he prayed, and this is what happened. He was saying... Why don't you pray to the Father also? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, Elijah was a righteous man. He was doing, he was doing what's right according to God. But look at the power of the prayer that you can have, the power of God, just by asking him. You're living a righteous life. You're doing what's right. You pray earnestly. You're talking to God and pleading with him and asking him for things. He'll listen to you. And he'll give it to you. And... You know, if we ask in faith, nothing wavering, hey, he's going to give it to us. He's a loving Father. He wants us to have the things that we, that we ask for. But let's bow our eyes and have a, a word of prayer. Your Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great example of Elijah the Tishbite, dear Lord. He was definitely an interesting character and, and performed a lot of miracles, dear God, and, and stood up for your name and wasn't afraid, even in the face of great opposition, dear Lord. He wasn't afraid. He didn't back down. He didn't backpedal and retract things that he said. He stuck by them, dear Lord, because he knew they were true, because he knew they were your words. God, I pray that you please help us never be ashamed of your words, never be ashamed of believing in the Bible or believing in Christ, dear Lord, no matter how um, fierce the opposition might be, but that we would simply just, just not buckle any pressure that we might be feeling or experiencing from others around us, but know that while it might not be comfortable, we're doing the right thing and we can take comfort and solace in that and help us all to understand that, you know, we know we're not alone. We know that there are plenty of people out there that haven't bowed the knee to, to, to bail and that are willing to stand up for what's righteous. Help us to encourage others who are putting themselves out there and who are at the brunt 
of, of receiving all the negativity on a, on a regular basis, dear Lord. Help us to encourage those people. Help us to keep them in prayer. And help us also to raise our own voices so that uh, they won't feel so alone out there, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.